TV radio listeners, this is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Uh, welcome to Monday. Uh, we are going to, this is a pre recorded interview for Monday, and as you know, on Mondays, I interview activists and discuss the issues going on in St. Louis, which is really. Uh, showing us that World War II has never really ended. They brought the war to the United States and the people of St. Louis are currently living with the radiation that uh, we used against the Japanese people and on a, a scale that is incomprehensible. So today I've asked back to join us to talk about uh, the situation in St. Louis and what's going on in terms of for fixing it, if it's even possible, uh, is Drew Kuhn from the Missouri Accountability Project. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce you. Thank you, Drew, for joining us. Hi, Lonnie. Thank you for for having me, and thanks for your listeners for for hanging out with us today. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. You want to just tell us where, where you're at and present what you yeah, need to share? Um, the... Uh, EPA had a community dialogue, uh, I guess it was almost two weeks ago, two, two Mondays ago. Uh, and there they discussed the four possible alternatives, uh, for remediating what, well, for, for deciding on what's like. Um, the first one, which they claim that, that's, it's not really on the table, it wasn't on the table to discuss, it was just something that they have to do. The first option is do nothing at all. Um, that's, that's not an option. option for us, that's but. an option. Do nothing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then the second one is a, um, a partial remediation, a partial removal. Um, they would. Um, they weren't really clear on how that process would would happen. Or, you know how they would decide what gets removed, what doesn't. Um, they seem to be for that because it uh, would maybe be cheaper and um, more more um, time efficient, but uh, we won't really know until their feasibility study comes out, which we're expecting here pretty soon. Well, you know what? Uh, and then the, thir- okay. uh, 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 the third option... I'll, I'll bide my time until you're finished. Yeah, yeah, just real quick. The the third option is uh, the 2008 record of decision, as it stands now, that to cap it and cap it and leave it to build a tarp over it, and which the National Remedy Review Board uh, for the EPA Superfund program um, 
said that it's not okay. And then the fourth option would be uh, full removal, uh, which is what um, most but not everyone at that meeting advocated for. Um, and, yeah, so those are the, those are our four, four options with this site. Um, to what extent the people actually have a say in that, I mean, just to be quite honest, really none. I mean, it's it, it gets decided internally. The EPA is only legally required to gather community input on the matter, but we don't have any final say um, in the matter, really. So, yeah. Well, welcome to the United Soviet States of America, right? I mean, that's yeah, really essentially you. what it is. I mean, this yeah. is the biggest shock I think for all of us, especially as we are unpeeling the onion of the nuclear lies, the technology, the criminal cartel that runs the corporations. I mean, if we thought Rockefeller and the uh, oil barons were bad at the beginning of the last century, if we even could even possibly begin to comprehend the harm that these people have done to our planet, the nuclear and the chemical pollution polluters is incomprehensible. Yeah. Um, but this is one of the things I wanted to ask you. In their, would you call this their study, some type of a study you said, a remedial study, or would you call that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, um... Because you said they're studying option two, right? And they think it's cheaper. But in their, in, oh, but... one of the things that I, is a big bone for me to pick whenever any of these government studies happen, they never factor in the human cost, not just in cost of lives lost and death and sorrow and tragedy that it creates. I'm talking about the economic factor. When you think about all the people in St. Louis who are sick or who have not been able to conceive, who have spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, keeping their lives alive. You know, all the people engaged. I mean, every family that I've seen on the Facebook page talks about their medications, their illness, their this, their that. Billions of dollars is being poured into their neglect from the nuclear industry. Yeah, I don't know if we have any exact figures, but it, the short sightedness of leaving, uh, leaving the waste is the, it, the, the groundwater contamination that's been found by the United States Geological Survey, confirmed by the EPA and designated as an operable unit of the Superfund site, um, does it, is not taken into consideration for this for this uh, record of decision because the record of decision, as they put it, only has to do with the soil. Right. Well, you know, I asked them at the meeting, I'm like, well, okay, then unless this radiation just fucking magically appears, uh, it, you know, in the water and it's not coming from anywhere but just, you know, some portal into another dimension, like, you're not telling me that, the, that there's not radioactive waste in that landfill, in that radioactive waste has been leaching into the groundwater, and if that's the case, and you want to, if it, you know, you want to advocate to leave even a little bit of that over generations, that groundwater will travel through the alluvial wells. It will get into the Mississippi, into the Missouri River. It will get into people's drinking water. It will get into the Mississippi. It will get into the, you know, it it keeps going, and I. It has. It, this is the point. I mean, it has. I don't mean to be it cruel, has. but I it, no, no, no. if we even I, understood, I understand. it is there. But it's through the surface water. Lonnie, let me be clear, because well, I know yeah, it's gotten under, And you understand water. The, this is your industry. Let's be clear. I mean, correct? That's what you do for a living. You work with that's water. That's what I study. Actually, I, no, I got I got fired from the water job. That's okay. a long story. We about it after all fair. But, yeah, <laughs> it's freed up some time. But what I'm saying is, you know, they're, the – the rainwater runoff of the surface water from either cold water creek or from the landfill, you know, that gets that gets into the surface water of these rivers that people rely on for their drinking water. I'm not saying it's not happening, but to continue to pollute the, the groundwater, the water that's that's deep underground, it's just insanity to me because they're gonna come back and it's gonna be the same thing. Like we're gonna be back in eight years to say or four years, however long they drag their feet. 
and and saying, hey, we got a problem with our groundwater. We know it's and, 15 you know, years. This is what they do. They study something. The EPA studies everything for 15 years. If you look at, go to the EPA website. This uh, is one thing I noticed. Hmm? 15 years. That's how long it takes them to make a decision. Begin yeah. to make a decision. Well, let me ask you this. I'm curious. That, I'm not going to ask you about the details of your job, but did you get fired for ethical reasons? Because you refused to comply with the lack of ethics? Or you spoke up no. against something? Okay, good. Um, maybe, but that wasn't technically the reason I got fired. Right. But, I mean, you had been speaking out against practices there because this is the thing. Our water... Oh, practice, practices there, no. I, I mean... It's all interconnected in some ways, but like, hmm. do you no, I got fired at... because. Go ahead. I, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, to what degree they did or didn't um, agree with what I spoke up about. To even the degree which they fucking paid attention at all, I have no idea. But um, no, I was fired because I didn't respond to a page that was never sent. They never sent me a page, but mm -hmm. apparently a page went out. I didn't respond to it. It was a violation of contract. It was no, it was totally inconsequential. Like, you know, there was no one was out of water. No one was. Do you, you know, think that innocent. you were targeted because of your activism? I don't know. I can't say that. I don't no. know. This is how they work. Exactly right. You don't know, but you know what? Just like we don't know that Hillary Clinton didn't kill Seth Rich. Like, right, but kind of interesting that he was about to give a report on election fraud at the Democratic Convention and was murdered the day before and shot yeah. in the back and abandoned. And now it comes out, instead of the Democrats talking about election fraud, they're talking about Julian Assange being, right. a, a, you know, a, a, a malicious character. It's it's incomprehensible. The, uh, well, what's interesting is there is not a small tide of people who are awake. I think there's a large tide of people, and this is why the propaganda machine is so heavy. But And they work really hard at keeping what's going on in St. Louis quiet. You notice that on the news, we never hear a word about nuclear. It's always a mystery cancer, a plume, the plume, the, the radiation plume that was coming across the Pacific Ocean in 2011. They said it would hit by, by 15. By 2015, we had a blob, a mysterious blob, right? But it's, we never hear the word radiation. So when you are in these meetings with the EPA, do they talk about radiation openly? Yeah. I mean, do they talk about uh, the effects of low ionizing radiation, as, uh, like the health effects of low ionizing yeah, radiation? Yeah, will they, they discuss any of that? No, uh, they will not, will they? they their line is, well, this is just, uh, it's slightly radioactive barium sulfate that is mixed with clean fill from, uh, from the slab site that was hauled but not contaminated anywhere else. It was just hauled straight to the landfill and it was put there in, in just the few select areas. And, you know, the narrative always changes. Like, it, it's never about, like, um, it's never about just the reckless, the recklessness of of, um, of digging up radioactive waste from from the airport site and leaving it in an online landfill, like they never it, it's always it always seems like they're trying to defend something. Like oh, well, they're well, trying not to defend bad. themselves. They've been ignoring it for seventy. No, years. it's not that bad. But I yeah, I don't I don't know I don't buy it. Yes, it's very bad. I mean, you guys have people dying in St. Louis. Don't they think it? They Are you telling me the EPA's position is that the leaking landfill is just not that bad of a deal? Uh, the landfill, yeah. I mean, Cody Pemberton's daughter, I don't mean to call her out, but Kirby Pemberton is the only person that's, that's Kirby had a. Had, Who's Kirby Pemberton? Who is that? Is Kirby Pemberton is the quote three hundred and two percent increase in rare child uh, brain cancers in the six zero three one Bridgeton zip code that was included in the Coldwater Creek study. Okay. Um, 
but she, yeah, she lived previously, from what I understand, closer to Coldwater Creek and then moved to Bridgeton, but was included in the survey. And that fact has kind of been misrepresented sometimes. And like, I don't know if anyone has really died as a, or a guy, you know, um, as, as a direct result of the, of the waste that was dumped at, at Westlake. However, it's the same waste mostly that was at Coldwater Creek. And we do have, you know, really good data on that right now. It's just that we ha it hasn't been studied for that long. Like we, when you wait talk about wait a minute, wait a minute Drew, can you can I just stop you here? Because you're starting yeah. to sound like the EPA's bullshit. Let's just back up here. You're telling me that you are saying that we don't know if people living next door to the Westlake landfill have died as a reason. This is what the EPA is claiming. They're saying that they can't. They will not accept the idea that nobody there's has been no died. Epidemiological, there's been no epidemiological studies is what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I won't accept the idea with evidence presented to me, but and I'm not saying that it's not possible, but what I'm saying is there's a big gap in time and, and research that's been done with Westlake as opposed to Coldwater Creek. Well, isn't that because the people in Coldwater Creek were the people who uh, – saw the connection, realized it, and put their pages up. And, like, I think the reason it hasn't, from my understanding, and I'm an outsider, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the reason there hasn't been the epidemiological studies is because there just isn't that uh, the people in Westlake don't have, they don't have the scientific mind. Like, it just was by coincidence there were some scientific minds living in the Bridgeton area, correct? That basically saw these things and they decided to create and start making their own statistics. They start they were thinking like scientists. So it, it requires a little bit of an effort at the Westlake landfill to get the community to participate. That's the issue, is I think don't you, am I incorrect on that? Uh, no. Uh, well <laughs> Sort of. when, I mean, when the for water me, came, as an outsider, it, it, it seems odd that Westlake and Bridgeton consider themselves two different groups. They're not that far but, away geographically. But as a, no, 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 I, you're right. There, there's two, the, the regions are interconnected. There's no separation there. What's, what's different is the Coldwater Creek Facts Organization, when these, you know, women and other people, they did this, um, they did this statistical analysis. Um, it was offered to the community of Bridgeton and the community around Westlake to be included in that study. That was refused. Um, and Kirby Penderton was the only one who had, who had offered and that was kind of late in the game, but her, her case was, uh, was from Bridgeton. So, I mean, so you're telling me the people in Westlake refused to join with Bridgeton? Is that what with that the means? with the with the Coldwater Creek study? Correct. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. With the Coldwater Creek, they said no, we want to be separate because they weren't because they were part of two different agencies. One was EPA and one was the Army Corps of Engineers. I don't know if that was why, but okay. Okay, well, that that to me would make sense if that would be, uh, that would make the logical sense as to why they're like, no, because it would make it almost impossible, don't you think? But this is the thing, they yeah. are really part of one system. No, it, it was a, right, it was, it was a statistical survey, and it was an independent analysis. I don't think it had anything to do with, with federal oversights. And that, I don't know why they okay. chose to not participate, but... What I'm saying is that there was a there was a chance to participate at a time. Okay. So basically, you, what you're also telling me then is Westlake Landfill really needs to get some epidemiological studies going. Are yeah. they going? Are they conducting them now? Uh, no, the HSCR has decided not to. What's the What is the HSDCR? Uh, the uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, the agency for Toxic Substances Disease and Disease Registry. Yes. Mouthful, but. Wait a minute. I'm about to fall off my chair. You were yeah. telling me our government agency said we do not need to study the epidemiological uh, considerations around the Westlake landfill where there is a leaking, a, a burning fuse wrap and 
uh, nuclear pollution just sitting there in an unlined container, and they don't want to create it. That's incomprehensible. Why? What? What was their reasoning? Um, that it was there. There wasn't uh, enough concentration of the original waste. Oh, I, my God! I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you verbatim. I, me- I mean, I went to the meeting. I went and sat in that meeting. I don't remember all of their exact reasons why, but did the they were like, "No, this is." Did the community it, put in their objections, and they're like, "Thank well, you very of course, much." But the commu- that doesn't mean anything. I mean, it, it, it means something, but it doesn't legally, procedurally, bureaucratically, it doesn't mean anything. Like, the government doesn't give a fuck about us. Pardon my language. Yeah. It's you know what? Right now. <laughs> yes. We're getting that message that we are. I mean, what does the intro to my show so say? We're assets on a balance sheet. We are their little live lab rats, that's for sure. So, Drew, after the show, would you send me that study and send me the contact to those people? Because I would love to have them on the air and talk to them about this. Because essentially what they're saying is that it does not matter. You know, how many tons is at the Westlake landfill? I mean, and they're going to tell us... It's that, been debated, but roughly, let's call it 50,000 tons. Right. So they're gonna, they're, you're going to tell me that because it's not part of the two hundred or 300,000 tons... It, I, 50,000 tons does not create an, a substantial health risk to the community? That's what, they're, um, excuse me, that's what they said at the time. That was probably appropriate. I don't agree with it. But. When did that happen? When did that decision happen? Uh, this was back in 2013 or 14. I think it was like the end of 13, beginning of 14. Well, why can't the community now, is there any push to go back to these people and say, uh, now we have two years more of uh, possible, more, you know, we've got a longer period of time, we want you to rethink this, this is just completely outrageous, because the fire has not stopped, and we have dead children popping up all over the place here, and children with disabilities, it's, uncon- you know, off the charts higher than the rest of the country. Yeah, that would, I mean, maybe the liaison that was working with uh, Westlake, her name's Erin Evans. Um, I think her email was erin at cdc.gov, but uh, she got, uh, she was replaced now. There's some, we haven't met her yet, but there's someone else that's taking right. up. Right, well, that's what they do. Yeah. They replace them and recycle them through, because they don't want them getting too friendly. Erin is still working with the Coldwater Creek. They're, they are doing an epidemiological study with, with Coldwater Creek. That's outrageous. That's outrageous news. That is completely outrageous. We need. Yeah. We, would you send me the contacts for these people that we need to talk to? Because we need to put public pressure on them. That's an outrageous position to be taking. I mean, we have waste from World War II, 50,000 tons. That's a hundred. I mean, that is just incomprehensible. 100,000 pounds, right? No, yeah. more than that. 100,000 pounds of waste sitting there, unlined. They're, it's not like they protected the environment. It's just dumped there, buried there, covered up with grass, and now it's burning. And they're going to tell us there is no health risk. There's not enough of it to cause a health risk study. That's um, incomprehensible. There, uh, I... I there may have been other factors. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't have that right in front of me. It actually hadn't occurred to me in a while until we started talking about it, the epidemiological thing. But um, uh, I know I, uh, I'll i dig through my files after our interview, but I know I have, um, I have all the papers that they gave me from that meeting. Wow. Well, good. But this is the thing. This is the issue. We need to not take their no. We need to be really determined salespeople, advocates on our own behalf. And this is why, like myself, in regards to St. Louis, I refuse to be shushed away. I'm not going to stop, to be honest. Like, I get it that I'm a West Coaster and I'm not from there, and I'm really, like, to be honest, I'm a hardcore flaming liberal, which probably a lot of people in St. Louis aren't and really don't like. (laughs) You know what I mean? I get that. But you know what the reality is? We're talking about humanity here. We're talking about being humane human beings, regardless of your political or religious bent. It doesn't matter whether I'm an atheist, a Jew, or a Christian. 
or a Muslim. We're talking about humanity and people dying and children getting, you know, young like you, Drew. You are a young man. You have got no clue what has happened to you yet. You won't find out. You won't know till as you live your life. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. These things present themselves while we're living. Oops, it's not like we can duck and cover. I mean, right. uh, in terms of, like, gun rights, this is an interesting thing because people talk about how dangerous gun rights are and we need to protect our country from gun rights. Well, nobody is talking about Fukushima going on for 2,000 days. And what's going on in St. Louis, 50 years. And how many yeah. people has that killed? Far more than get killed with guns every year. Far more. The implications is astounding. So, you know, I don't know. So, so Drew, what is the plan? What You gave us this summary. These are their four options. You said their inclination is to do the partial cleanup because it's cheaper, which means that's what they're going to do, frankly. Yeah. When, when they say they like something, that's what they're going to do. They're, they're telling you what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, I plan moving forward is to write an open letter to advocate for full removal. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else I can do. How many people do you think it would take to sway them? Oh, I don't think any. I don't think it. I don't matter. think any. I don't think it matters. They're going to do what they're going to do, and what they're going to do is continue to lie and protect the interests no, of so corporations. Say even just, um, say even uh, like a fifth of the population of St. Louis got out in the streets and they were like, nope, not going to happen. You're going to take all that shit out. You know, they call in the National Guard. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're a kid or you're uh, a student or you're an old woman or if you're a fucking Holocaust survivor. They call in the National Guard. They handcuff you. They mace you. Like, there's a war on the people. And it's like, I... Mm -hmm. You're I, telling I, me. I'm telling you, I kind of feel powerless in this. Um, so the you know, get... But you know what, Drew? This is why I advocate. This is why I, I am so grateful for my show. Because you know what? They want us to feel powerless. We are not powerless. We need to regain our power and our voice. It's only through us exercising our voice and our courage. Because, yes, they're brutal dictators, and they are going to try to intimidate us with force. That doesn't mean they can win. We can be stronger standing together, holding each other's hands side by side. They cannot and they will not kill everybody if we stand up together. And that's the point. They want us to sit down and back down. And then we can continue to be their little lab rats. I mean, that's what I mean, they want. They yeah. want us to be their little lab rats. And you know what? No. I I reject their paradigm. You know, even... My, my point was that I don't see a change happening from, from you know, uh, Picketing, I see a, I see a change happening from picking up a pen and a paper, from writing into, you know, you, yeah, using our voice and, um, showing up to meetings. Showing up. That's yeah. what matters. You gotta go to these meetings and show up and participate. Go to the EPA and make comments. Put, let them know, put the pressure on them because this is their jobs. And this is the thing to remember. They're just ordinary people going to work. Sure. And they're doing oh, what yeah. their culture has taught them to do. Yeah, I am mad at them. But at well, the same I, time, I, like... I think we need conscientious objectors. Way. Like, I really believe we need conscientious objectors. We need people to say, you know what? I'm not going to go to work and lie about the facts. and the, I'm not going to allow the meters to be changed by a factor of 10 or by 10 points. Or I'm not... I refuse to do what my bosses tell me to do. And, I, and you, you know, like, this is how trade unions got started. I mean, this is why in the 30s in the last century in the 20s I apologize yeah, and people died for trade union I mean people were killed yes and lots of people like in Virginia there was like I think thousands of people mowed down you know they just said no we're not taking it but you know what the miners held firm and they were able to organize and they did make a difference 
And, and so, you know, it does matter. It really, really does matter because it's kind of like the Clean Water Act that happened in the 70s. Like, I was talking to yeah. someone this morning about Greenpeace. You know, like Greenpeace's signature movement was to stop the nuclear radiation from being poured directly into the ocean. That was there for the first 15, 20 years. We weren't even told there was nuclear waste, that we had nuclear power. They didn't even tell us. They were just dumping it in the ocean. And then Greenpeace was formed and got wind of it, and they sent their boats out. They stopped it. It was a huge movement. And then something happened, and Greenpeace stopped even looking at nuclear. This is why I, this is why I was talking about it this morning with Mimi German of No Nukes Northwest. It was like, Greenpeace doesn't even talk about nuclear. We want them to be take a no nuke stance because, especially since the Arctic is melted, we've discovered that uh, Russia – that was their dumping ground for all their nuclear waste. And the reason they can't go drilling in the Arctic is because of all the nuclear waste from Russia is in such precarious positions. They're afraid they're going to cause a nuclear radioactive catastrophe up there if they disturb those billions of barrels they found up there. You know, you think you guys had a lot of waste? Russia was dumping it for 10, 15, 20 years in the tundra up there. Mm. Yes, it's, and these yeah. are stories that people don't talk about. You know what I mean? They just come and go. That, like I've read these stories and I've archived them because people, you know, you try to find a lot of these stories and they just disappear. And that's how the oligarchs. Yeah, following following on Vice is from last year about the Soviet Union um, dumping nuclear submarines, reactors, and containers into the Arctic Ocean. Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, but that was the early nineties. Yeah, but they did it for a long time. That they had buried it a lot. They had, they found a huge cache of the nuclear barrels at the bottom of the ocean. The Russians were using that as their dump site. Hmm. So they have thousands and thousands and thousands of casts of waste up there. And this is the worst part. They were fine as long as they were frozen, but they're not frozen anymore. So those. Well, this is interesting because you mentioned that Greenpeace doesn't take a stance on nuclear, but they quote Greenpeace in this article about um, the K-159 is at risk of causing environmental catastrophe because of deterioration of the reactor container. Any leak from the K-159 would affect fisheries, both Russia and Norwegian, Bomer, and Russians and Norwegians. Bomer yeah. said, Bomer's the guy that they quoted. Yes, but we're not, Greenpeace does not take a, a, a anti-nuke stance of saying no nukes. I did get a message once from uh, Greenpeace, though, when I did call them out on this, and they said, for sure we are anti-nuclear, but we, we, I, and Mimi agrees with me, they need to be, they have been relatively silent about Fukushima and St. Louis, in my view. What is going on in St. Louis is a crime against humanity, in my view. I mean, as an American, I really believe that we have failed St. Louis. Our country is failing St. Louis and the people of St. Louis and especially the youth. And uh, I find it unconscionable that our country is just willing to turn a blind eye to not just St. Louis, but like Illinois, Apollo, those little towns that were all connected to the Manhattan Project. All of these little yeah. towns connected to the Manhattan Project. Every, in fact, everything attached to the Manhattan Project has just been a complete whitewash and a crime against humanity, in my view. And for yeah. the American public to take a blind eye to the catastrophic harm, it's not just, oh, some people are going to get sick and cancer and have, you know, we know that for every two rads of radiation in the air for a population of a million they know we're going to have 32,000 extra leukemias and cancers. They know we're going to have over 225,000 birth defects. That we know. But we're talking about harm to future generations is unconscionable. We don't even see the negative effects of that radiation for 8 to 10 generations out. The worst of it starts 8 to 10 generations out. So... We've got a long, a lot of come up and stay to us, you know. It's uh, my hats off to you, Drew, for standing and continuing to take action on this. Um, Thanks, Bob. You know, you and I haven't talked about this, and I don't mean to throw you a curveball, so we can pass on this one. But have, do you know uh, so much water, Alex Cohen? 
Have, has the Missouri Accountability Project joined forces with them? Yeah, we were, uh, we were both in Philadelphia together. Great. So you were on that film that you guys did, the die-in. You guys were part of the die-in. Uh, which one? In Philadelphia? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I saw that. So yeah, I, must, I must have seen you in there somewhere. Um, I was, uh, I was handing out flyers. We brought a, brought a bunch of, um, like, a stack of, like, a thousand flyers. So out of um, all those thousand flyers, has any of those people who took those flyers contacted you and started to get engaged? Have they contacted me directly through the website? No. But people have contacted me, and at the end of that event, uh, when the park was closing, I kind of stuck around to help clean up stuff and just pick up trash. Um, I did not see one flyer on the ground or in a trash can or crumpled up or, you know, everyone took the flyer with them for whatever that's worth. Whether they read it or not, I don't know. Drew, but, maybe this is what we should do, and maybe we should put this out on the radio shows why I bring it up publicly. You know, for all those people that are contacting you around the country, we ought to really try to get some type of a public voice going. I mean, if you could have those people, you know, we could do like an interview with them talking to you, or you guys could, we could figure out what actions we could take because the country well, at the time we, at the time we were asking everyone to call their senators and their congress people, and their congress people, um, particularly the House uh, Energy and Commerce Subcommittee, because that's where House Bill Forty One Hundred is stuck right now. And at the time, it seemed like it's getting pretty, you know, it was barely on life support, so we were trying to give it a, a jolt, so to speak. But, um, you know, uh, after all of those calls and all those weeks, I did not see one statement or letter or anything come out of uh, that committee or from any of those respective Congress people, um, you know. I followed up, but you know, oh, we don't really have a comment. It's, we well, don't know. Not it's, going to comment. it's not on the schedule. You know what I think? I think it's going to get passed. See, the thing is, we've already passed the budget for 2017. There's no money for St. Louis in 2017 on the fuse wrap budget. That's already been passed. And I think that's why they didn't want to pass the but bill. This wouldn't be a fusion. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah, it would. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you said super fun. And... No, it's a fuse wrap. <laughs> To me, alphabet numbers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a soup. Uh, but this is the thing. I, uh, I would be a little bit surprised what, knowing how they work in Congress. That bill will probably get passed out of budget in the next year once the EPA says they're going to do a partial removal. They're not going to assume full responsibility because there's just not enough money. They're not going to do a full. They're, so the, this, when you consider that our fuse wrap budget Five years ago, since the Republicans took over, it was at 112 million, 120 million dollars a year. Imagine that's all it is—is is 120 million dollars a year for fuse yeah. wrap. I mean, I, if I'm incorrect on that, maybe let me take a look. I don't think it's even a billion dollars, but uh, it has gone down to 105. It is actually stunning when we consider how little money our country pours into remediation and taking care of the problem that they allow the polluters to use. You know what I mean? Like The polluters have just a free hand of it. Very little money. And uh, let's see, what was it? It is going to be... Oh, okay, so this is, let's see. The Civil Works budget, so I am completely wrong on that one. Let me see what it says. Billion, $4.6 billion, not million, $4.6 billion. The President's budget fiscal year includes $4.6 billion in discretionary funding for Civil Works of the Army U.S. Corps of Engineers. Let me see, what does it say, the fuse wrap budget? Uh, expenditures, formally, yeah, I'm right. Oh my God, this is stunning. $103 million for formally utilized site remediation action program. That's fuse wrap, baby. We're mm -hmm. only out of all the fuse wrap sites around the country, and there are hundreds, we only have $103 million. Ooh. Wow. 200, 
2.7 billion for operation and maintenance. That means salaries. 1.9 bill, 1.09 million for construction. 22 million for the Mississippi River and tributaries. 200 million for regulatory programs. I wonder if you guys could get any money from that Mississippi River and tributaries. I wonder because that's 222 million. $180 million for expenses, $103 million for the fuse wrap, $85 million for investigations, $30 million for flood control and coastal. Do you guys have any of that, flood control and coastal emergencies? That's for the probably the insurance. $5 million for the Office of Assistant Secretary of the Army Corps of Civil Works. So this is astounding. Don't you think this is astounding, Drew? I mean, I'm actually completely stunned that we have... Uh, only a hundred and three million dollars. It used to be a hundred and twenty million when they took over in two thousand and ten, and every year the Republicans are cutting it back. Because yeah, but I want to be clear, also, just to not feed into that propaganda that this is going to cost the taxpayers all this money. The principal responsible parties ultimately pay for uh, the work done by Food Strap. May not be right away, but they do pay for it, and it's and it's incremental at times, but. Um, Say that you know, again. The, so the like principal Republic's, responsible parties are like, let's say Republic. Let's say let's just use Republic Services for example. Mm -hmm. Republic Services would have to pay for the fuse wrap bill for the cleanup. Yeah, but then what's the hello? Hey. Hang on, let me hold, let me hang up on you under the line. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so here we go. We're recording again, so we'll take a three-second break and head back in. Did you remember what we were talking about? Yeah, principal responsible parties and their costs. Okay, one, two. Okay, so we're back. We had a little bit of a snafu on our call, so we had to reconnect again. Uh, we have about 15, 18 minutes left on the interview. Uh, Andrew, we were talking about uh, responsible parties, right? I'm trying to figure out what you were saying yeah. about the fuse wrap budgeting. So, so this $103 million, our government allocates the $103 million, and then mm -hmm. the responsible parties pay the government back? Correct. That's why it's only $103 million as a way to protect the corporations from having to spend a lot of money. Mm, yeah, actually, that's right. I never thought about it that way. You know, if the, if the responsible parties are paying them back, why don't they have a blank check? Right. You know what I, I mean, mean? Why, why isn't the budget increasing? I mean, why has it been since the Republicans took over the check. budget? The budget has been decreased every year that the Republicans have been in power. They forced through. And this is what kind of really made me mad about this current budget. Claire McCaskill voted for that budget. She should have it just argued and said no. Even It would have passed without her vote. They did not need her vote. She could have just made a, a complaint. You know what I mean? Like filed a... Right. I'm, the word escapes me what I'm looking for, a protest vote. You know what I mean? She could have stuck yeah. up for the people of Missouri and said, screw you, there's not enough money for our people, there's no money, we have a catastrophe going on, I'm not voting for this budget. And instead, the woman that I helped elect by sending her campaign funds while she was running turned her back on the citizens of St. Louis. And I'm going to, this is why I am a proud Dem exit. This is why I, when the, de the Democratic convention happened, I looked at it and said, oh, my God, we have nope. one party, and it's the Republicrats, and this is why. So this fuse wrap budget, the... This is why there's no money. This is the answer. Now, that's the missing connecting dot there. Because inside that budget committee, you know, Frank Pallone's wife works with the EPA. She uh, I don't think she does. She anymore. Might she worked for them for a long time. Yeah. And she worked on the, the committee for women and children. 
<laughs> mm. ironically, you know. Mm. So, but really, what they're doing is they're protecting the interests of the major corporations by keeping the fees wrap budget low. Yeah. Because there's not enough money, a hundred and three million dollars. I mean, St. Louis alone could use a hundred and three million dollars in one year. Yeah. I mean, it's outrageous. It's it's kind of like what happened in where I grew up, you know, in in Redondo Beach. I mean, I discovered on the EPA's website that in for 15 years there was a corporation that was dumping chemicals right on the beach, and the EPA solution put rocks on top of it so the ocean won't make it so it'll protect it from going into the ocean oh my god that's crazy that's what they did and actually i got sick i moved away from california for that reason because i was like oh my god it's just too polluted every time i went in the ocean in redondo by if i even touch the water my feet itch so badly huh. you go to redondo beach there's like little flags swim at your own risk you know yeah i mean it's it's really it's it's dangerous we are polluting our entire country it's beyond comprehension it's just you know and yet Greenpeace makes 33 million dollars a year <laughs> cha-ching huh yeah wow Drew so I how do you feel about all this being such a young man and living in the stew how does this make you feel uh, it makes me feel um, motivated to do something more to uh, to get the fuck out basically like I mean but I don't want to just leave out of fear I want to leave because I you know there's something that like better something better yeah yeah I get you well, the thing is, I think you should leave. I'm just going to tell you that straight up. It's dangerous for you I'm to live there. I, you know, I'm going to tell you what I told Kevin Finnegan. You're welcome to come here. People should leave highly toxic radiated zones. I don't believe we should. If we abandon them, like, I can't understand the people in Flint, Michigan, just not exiting, mass exiting, getting in their cars and driving away. I would never live there. I mean, it's beyond common. Where do you go? I mean, those, you got to consider a lot of those people in Flint were very poor, are very yeah, poor. But, that's true. So, I, I mean, mean, I'm sure they, many yeah. of them would have to move too. Yeah. But. Isn't that the truth? And that is what they count on. They count on the fact that people are too poor to just pick up and leave. You can't have a max exodus. What are you going to do? Just become homeless street people? You, and you, even if you have six, seven hundred dollars, you hit the road with two kids. You're good for two days, three days. You know, yep. it's outrageous. And I mean, we have a serious crisis in our country, and I have no idea what the answers are. I just know that. I want to organize, like the people that you gave your flyers out to that met you at the Democratic Convention, those are motivated people. But mm -hmm. I want to turn them into action to get St. Louis, you know, some action. Take. I mean, the President of the United States could actually sign a statement today that says we're going to give emergency funding to St. Louis with or without the state, the governor calling it a state emergency. The, the president of the United States pretty much has the power to give money to anybody. Yeah. President, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out about this. The president of the United States also is coming up to make a decision whether or not he will respect the treaties, uh, between the federal government and the uh, the Sioux Nation, um, to and whether or not um, the Dakota Access Pipeline will be able to um, be brought through uh, um, reservation territory uh, and drilled under the Missouri River. Um, so that's supposed. To, um, there are sixty indigenous uh, first First Nations. Um, at the Standing Rock Reservation now. Um, last estimate I heard was roughly 3,000 people. Uh, they just had a hearing in D.C. Uh, over the pipeline and to challenge the, um, you know, the Army Corps' um, position on that. And, you know, they have pretty good, pretty good argument, but we won't know for another month. Um, in the meantime, uh, I wanted to 
you know, shout out my love and solidarity and um, to the <clears throat> all of the people, um, uh, First Nations peoples and um, and white folks, plenty of white folks up there too. And, but you know, you know they're I all, actually feel that most together. Americans feel that way. I think most Americans stand in solidarity with that part of our nation, the First Nations, the the original people who were here. I mean, we. Most Americans, I believe, these days are completely aware that we were sold a bill of goods about who the first people were and what we've done to them. And we really, but, you know, well, let me ask you this. Do you know what the plan of action is when the government says uh, you lose First Nations? Because generally the government sides against them 100% of the time. Most of the time. Um, so, like, are we going to be putting our bodies in the street? Is that the bottom line? People are just going to go there in mass and say, "Hell no, we're no, we won't go." I mean, is that really what we got to do? See, that's I mean, what that's, I think we need to do all across the nation. You know, in China, they actually stopped a nuclear power plant from being built in one of their provinces. People, so yeah. many people protested. The government backed down. There was hundreds of thousands of people in the streets said, "No, we're not having nuclear out here." Yeah. You know, that's what yeah. we need. But, you know, the Occupy movement did a really good job. Uh, the president did a really good job of killing the Occupy movement. He is quite and, a good uh, servant of Wall Street, in my view. Could have probably a whole other interview about this, but the FBI actually started Occupy Wall Street. Uh, look up Sabu, what? FBI. I'm not talking, I'm not messing with you, Ari. This is, this is real. The FBI... Um, flipped an informant. His name was Sabu. He gave the Strat Four keys to Jeremy Hammond, who hacked the private intelligence corporation. At the same time, they started Occupy Wall Street. Sabu was like the was like the main dude that like Why? was like street get out in the streets. I mean, they had him on some type of charges, but um, why would they have started it? I, yeah. I don't uh, know why it does make sense. I mean, because they could feel it burbling. They could feel it. Look, Occupy started just about the time Fukushima happened, when we were being told to ignore Fukushima. So you have this big movement of social, we're going to get ourselves, you get everybody all slathered up, and then you come down hard. The hand. Look what has happened since Occupy. Nobody, everybody that you talk to says, it doesn't matter. We tried it with Occupy, and nothing matters. There's nothing we can do. It, it, going back to sleep. it really f not just went back to sleep. They are cowering in the corners. They're not asleep. They're cowards. People do not want to speak out because they are afraid they're going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose their status. Look, Drew, you probably lost your job. It's a very real threat. It sounds to me like you got sabotaged. And that's, you know, when you said it was bullshit at the early, earlier in the show, it sure did sound like it to me. And it probably has a lot to do with your political activism. This is the ironic part. Protecting our, our cities and our people and our planet is considered a political position. It's outrageous. Yeah. It's, but, uh, hey, on the bright side, it, I, you know, I got fired just in time to where I could take a week and go to Philadelphia. <laughs> um, Great. You know, yeah. I found a restaurant job. It's, you know. Good. I'm making it. It's just. So you're working. So that's good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Well, congratulations. That's, this is what Americans do, man. We don't let anything stop us. That This yeah. is why, to me, see, we live in different parts of the country. You've never been here. I've never been there. But as a people, we feel like one people because we have the same core values. Work hard, do yeah. good, be good. You know what I mean? That's yeah. kind of the basis. Yeah. And right now we have a government doing exactly the opposite. They're lazy as all get out. And they don't do good and they are not good. They do bad. They do intentionally bad to see how much they can get away with. It's incomprehensible <laughs> that Americans and, – and this whole thing about the Occupy movement, wow – that's kind of a bit of a revelation, I have to say, Drew, for me. That I had never even heard that. That is the first time I'd heard that. 
So you're telling me that Occupy was kind of a COINTELPRO, like they, they planted yep. the Occupy movement in the public eye. And, but how did how and why did they allow it to grow, and why did they slam it closed so hard? Um, I figure because with the 2008 crash, I mean, they knew one way or the other people were going to be real pissed, and they were going to get out in the streets and... You know, it could have been a revolution, but if, if you see a revolution coming, then, you know, if you can create another revolution to subvert that, one that you can more easily control, one that you guide. Oh, my God. Then, Occupy Wall it, Street started it, it, September 17th, 2011. I know exactly why they did it. If it really was, this is why it's a Fukushima. It's part of the Fukushima cover-up. Because we started to realize by March, April, May that we had massive nuclear meltdowns. Massive nuclear meltdowns going on. And the NRC was desperately trying to keep us from even thinking about it. They fired JASCO. The the president came out and said, don't worry about it, everything's fine. So they plant this Occupy Wall Street to, we're going to rectify the country and talk about all the other civil rights. And then you get people slathered up, squash them down. Now what happens when you talk to anybody about Fukushima and coming out in the street about the pollution in St. Louis or in Fukushima? Day 2000 is coming up. I am personally going to create a little protest here in Eugene or in Portland or Astoria. We're trying to figure out where's the best place. There's a small group of us around here in Oregon, and we're going to meet up and we're going to do something, either on the 1st, which is day 2000, or the following weekend. Because we can, we must make people remember. But what happens? Yeah. This was very effective. Oh, my God, Drew, this is really astounding. This is I'm really blown away by this. Wow. Because that's exactly the Occupy Wall Street movement was created to keep us from thinking about Fukushima. Oh, my God. The collusion. These people. They, I mean, we have, what, 87 people running most of the decisions on the planet. Yep. Oh, dear, dear, dear me. <laughs> If people even understood how magnificent they are, they would never put up with this, ever. You know, and this whole movement is about keeping people from understanding how really awesome humanity really is. Because we have such magnificent abilities and capabilities, it's unbelievable. So, Drew, what could we do as we wind up this interview? What could we do out here on the outside? Again, is there anything we can do to organize to help you or what would what actions would you like our listeners to take to help you and St. Louis? I would just I would just sit down and take the time and talk with your family, talk with your neighbors, you know, sit down and have sit down and have a, a conversation and just, you know, um, try to um Try to spitball or try to, you know, brainstorm ideas because I think uh, with whatever your cause um, and whatever the whatever the thing is you're fighting right now or fighting for or fighting against, um, you know, creative protests really, like, that's, I think that's the way to, to get people, to inspire people and to get people to remember you know, whatever it is that you're fighting for, fighting against. Like, um, I wasn't part of it, and I didn't really know about it until, like, it was happening, but uh, a group at the SEPA dialogue, um, at the very end of the meeting, they uh, silently walked to the middle of the room and died. You know, there was a die-in. Um, so, um, I think the time is for us to uh, to get clever, to get creative, and try to think of new ways of of resistance and disrupting the status quo. <clears throat> and I think that can, you know, that comes through dialogue. So who better to you know to talk to than than your neighbors, your family, your community? Just talk to people. Drew Kuhn from the Missouri Accountability Project. 
And uh, Drew, I hope you will come back and share more of your activism with us on the radio show again. Absolutely. I look forward to it, Lonnie, and thanks again for having me on. Thanks for your listeners for, for hanging out, and uh, I'll see you next time. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and you take care. Put your courage feet on, everybody, and take action and do something.